Hello and welcome to today's talk, Wednesday the 26th of January. Now mostly today I want to look at the new round of the REACT study, which is the largest antigen study in the world, looking at large numbers of people in England. Uh, but just before we get on to that, I just want to do a quick orientation. So this, this is new daily confirmed cases per million people. Now we see countries that are very highly vaccinated, like Israel and Denmark, getting huge numbers of breakthrough infections. So there's no question that the Omicron symptomatic is smashing through the vaccine-induced defences. But it is important to remember for people that have not had natural infection, the vaccine is vital to keep them out of hospital. So we need to keep that perspective. Now, uh, so Israel, Denmark, very high cases per capita. France is going up. Gibraltar, also very highly vaccinated, of course, cases going, cases remaining high, I would say, in Belgium. In Gibraltar, and, and exactly the same figures as Belgium, coincidentally. Netherlands increasing with Omicron. United States, where it looks like things are just starting to go down in the United States, as we've looked at. Germany, they're still going up. United Kingdom, from that there, levelish, but we do believe... Well, actually, the United Kingdom is a bit complicated. It has been going down, but there's been just a little blip lately, a bit of an uptick lately. So we'll have to discuss that separately at some point. Uh, Ireland going down nicely, reflect, reflecting the short-lived uh, Omicron wave in Ireland. Japan, Canada and uh, India. And uh, I haven't got it on that graph there, but New Zealand. When you look at New Zealand on this graph, it actually looks flat. But in actual fact, there are some community cases in New Zealand now. And we'll be, be looking at some of the implications for that later on. Basically, it means Omicron is going to spread around New Zealand. So if you're in New Zealand now, I would expect to be infected with Omicron over the next couple of months is, is the likely scenario, I believe. So uh, that was a uh, case. Now, hospitalizations. Um, now, we see that the United States is still high, as indeed is France. Now, in the United States, it's partly the financial incentive that they get reimbursement if people are diagnosed with uh, with COVID when they're admitted. So they're certainly on the lookout for that because of the financial reasons. But it's also because of the comorbidities in the States causing high levels of hospitalisation. France, I think that reflects the increase in cases lately. Belgium, Canada, United Kingdom, hospitalisation slightly up in the United Kingdom. Israel, given the very high number of cases in Israel, relatively low, well, very low levels of hospitalisation, really. Ireland, Denmark, Japan, uh, Netherlands. So, if, for example, just look at Israel there. So that's where Israel is in the sort of hierarchy of hospitalisations. Just a little bit below the UK at the moment has been a little bit above. But when we look at the cases, wow, I mean, they're right up there. So we see that um, vaccination and previous infection is protecting against uh, severe outcomes, which is, is, is good. Now, um, but as we'll see, it's not protecting against um, symptomatic disease, or as we have seen, and <laughs> we'll see that further. So this is the REACT study, Real-Time Assessment of Community Transmission Findings, round 17. So this has been done pretty well every month every four or five weeks since the start of the pandemic. And it's the REACT-1. The REACT-1, as you'll probably remember, is the study of the uh, antigens. Uh, the react that, That's the actual virus itself. The REACT-2 is the study of the, uh, the antibodies, the body's reaction to the virus. Uh, but this is REACT-1, just looking at antigen levels. And it's quite clever. It's conducted with Ipse Mori, which, of course, is the polling organisation. So very professionally conducted study, uh, uh, funded by the UK government. Uh, headline here: 65% of the uh, of 65% uh, of the infected said they had already had previously previously tested positive for COVID-19. So 65% of people who tested positive for Omicron in this wave reported that they had previously tested positive. So conclusive evidence here of reinfection. People are getting symptomatic disease. People are testing positive after previous infection but they're much less likely to get hospitalized um, imperial college london lots of references there so uh, the background here rapid transmission of the sars coronavirus 2 variant has led to the highest ever recorded case incidence levels in many countries around the world as we've said omicron is the new uh, pandemic uh, the, the real-time pcr test results self-administered nose and throat swabs uh, randomly assigned throughout england so it's a big study they've got 
uh, they sent out a lot more than this, but they've got over 100,000 results back. Patients uh, or individuals from five years of age and over. Data here was collected between the 5th of January and the 20th of January 2020. And they're able to look at temporal, uh, socio-demographic, geographical spread of the virus. They can look at all sorts. It's a really sophisticated study. Uh, they can look at viral loads. They look at the genome and the sequence data for positive swabs. So they can look at all that. So if it's positive, in other words, they do a genomic analysis. So uh, the results, um, swab positivity was a uh, 4.41%. Now, we have seen higher positivities in, in other countries, much higher in other countries, but this is, this is the highest we've ever seen in the UK or has been officially recorded. Uh, threefold higher than it was in December uh, 2021, which was Delta. So we see that basically there's massively more community transmission of Omicron, uh, massively more as we, uh, as we anticipated and as we've always uh, maintained. So uh, 1,400 uh, sequence positive to the 16th of January, which is the time they've had to do the genomic sequences up to. 99% were Omicron, uh, including six, uh, that's 0.43% of the BA2 variant sublineage. Now, if you watched yesterday's video, and I apologise for the poor sound yesterday, I think we've fixed it now, but um, the BA2 lineage is an Omicron uh, variant um, it didn't come from the BA1. They've both been, uh, they both developed separately from some common uh, ancestor, uh, probably a f couple of months ago. And uh, it looks like the BA2 is replacing the BA1. It's transmitting much more faster, but it's not making people sicker. So if anything, this could be good news because it means that the herd immunity is going to develop quicker. But it's probably twice as transmissible as the BA1. So this is going to become the predominant predominant strain but it's not a cause for concern it just means that it's going to spread around quicker and that the the waves should uh, more people will be infected more quickly uh, but there again the wave is going to be more compressed it doesn't seem to be causing more hospitalizations or more more severe disease uh, 14 one percent were delta um, so de de delta now is probably just about gone so remember as, as of the 16th of january it was one percent delta I would be amazed if Delta's, well, I, I would expect Delta now to be 0.1% uh, or something like that. So Omicron's completely replaced Delta, as, as we predicted. Remember, we uh, there was a, a Chris Whitty was talking about this and he said we had two pandemics. I said, I don't think we have. I think it's just a very transitory phenomena. And, and turns out I was right. Um, Delta uh, has been completely replaced by Omicron. Um, within round 17, prevalence was decreasing overall. So up, up to, when was it? Up to the 20th of January, prevalence was going down, but it was increasing in children uh, aged 5 to 17. So th this, this was just like a snapshot within the, within the time period because they do temporal analysis. That was between the 5th and the 20th of January. Um, swab positivity in the more at-risk 75-year-olds, uh, again, high community prevalence in older people with a greater risk of hospitalisation. Uh, it is transpiring through into some increase in hospitalisation, but not massive. Doesn't mean to say hospitals aren't severely stretched. My hospital colleagues are very stretched and um, uh, they've got a big backlog of cases as well. So it's not saying there's no problem, but it's, it's, it's um, in terms of the Omicron load on the on the health service it is decreasing compared to the delta which is good uh, large multiple occupancy households the odds ratio was 1.66 about 66 percent more likely to be positive if you uh, live in a large household uh, about 24 percent odds ratio 1.24 more likely to be positive in the urban areas now i think this just re reflected well partly it reflected the the period of time that the cities were infected first but also we know that air uh, the, the incidence in other parts of the country has never reached as high as it was in London. So London was particularly high, probably due to lower vaccination uptake rates in certain sectors of the population. Um, and now the, the most, uh, so people in uh, more deprived areas, economically deprived areas, 33% uh, more likely to be uh, infected. But I, I'm not too sure about this because 
um, in, in what we might call, I don't like the term deprived areas, but what people call deprived areas, um, my, my thinking is that people would be more likely to do the swab if they were symptomatic. Therefore, you would pick up more people. So I don't really think we can interpret that as a genuine result, to be quite honest. This, this would appear to say the odds ratio is 1.33 or 33% increased chance of you living in a deprived area. But does that reflect propensity in what we're, for want of a better term, calling deprived areas, that there's an increased propensity to um, carry out the test? if you are symptomatic because even though there was just over 100,000 people reported back on on this study over 800,000 people were asked to take part so that's the big weakness this sort of um, self-selection bias really uh, in adults who received um, th three versus two vaccine doses higher CT value that was the lower viral load in rounds 15 and 16 so people that had three vaccines in round 15 and 16, and of course in round 15 and 16 it was mostly Delta, they had higher CT values, therefore they had lower viral loads. In other words, a third dose was reducing viral load, making severe illness less likely <coughs> with Delta. But this was not the case with Omicron. So people that had three doses of vaccine were not getting lower viral loads with Omicron, which is another aspect of vaccine immune escape that we're seeing with Omicron. Now, this continued on a finding that we've seen in the past rounds in rounds 15 and 16. The distribution of CT values, in other words, the viral loads, were similar in unvaccinated and vaccinated children aged 17 and below. So the distribution of viral loads was similar in unvaccinated and vaccinated children. Now, what this seems to mean is that whether children are vaccinated or not doesn't influence their viral loads if they become infected, which is interesting. Because this means that if children are infected, whether they're vaccinated or not, is not going to influence significantly how much virus they're shedding and therefore the likelihood that other members of the family will be uh, infected. So that's an interesting point. Prevalence in those shielding was 3.43% uh, of people shielding. And in those not shielding, it was 4.61%. Now, that's not a massive difference. Given that these people are shielding and these people are not, that's not a huge difference between the two, indicating that you can't really, or this, at least this proportion of people, couldn't shield themselves against Omicron because it is just so transmissible. And the BA2 is even more transmissible than the original Omicron. So shielding looks like it's no longer effectively shielding for that uh, proportion of people. Conclusions. Unprecedented level of infections with uh, SARS coronavirus 2 in England. Yep, that's for sure. Almost complete replacement of Delta by Omicron, as we have long anticipated. Uh, vaccination including the booster campaign remains the mainstay of the defense against hospitalization yes against infection no given the high levels of protection against hospitalization so th that's true so it does give good levels of protection against hospitalization in people that have not been previously infected however further measures beyond vaccination may be required if the very high rates of omicron infection persist but they don't quite say uh, what that <laughs> what that is but uh that brings us on to the world health organization quite nicely um so hans klung is the uh european head of the who between vaccination and natural immunity through infection omicron offers plausible hope for stabilization and normalization in other words uh, it looks like omicron has saved the uh has saved the situation according to Hans Kloon there from the WHO. Um, good to see that he's not saying it's WHO advice that's taken, uh, that's helped us out. It's just the fact that we've been sufficiently fortunate to have this Omicron wave. Dr. Tedros, though, the overall boss of the WHO, it's dangerous to assume that Omicron will be the last variant or that we are in the end game. Well, I think we are in the end game, actually. Um, on the, on the contrary, uh, globally, the conditions are ideal for more variants to emerge. Well, that is true, as, as we've seen with this Omicron subvariant, the BA2 has emerged. 
but it seems to have the same characteristics of Omicron, so we're not particularly worried. It's true that we'll be living with COVID for the foreseeable future. Yes, it is becoming endemic, at least for a period of time. And he says, Dr. Tedros says it's a preventable and treatable disease. Well, preventable? Well, I don't think it is preventable, Dr. Tedros, actually. I think I think the data we've just shown there on, on people shielding, uh, if they can't prevent it in their shielding, then how can anyone else prevent it with any anything like a normal life? So I, I disagree quite profoundly. I don't think it is preventable. And we know that vaccination doesn't prevent against uh, symptomatic disease either. And to talk about treatments, the World Health Organization to talk about treatments really is a bit rich considering their track record on, um, shall we say, uh, not encouraging certain treatments that have been proposed. So, uh, but that, anyway, we report what they say. Now, Omicron in New Zealand, what is going on in New Zealand? Um, we could do, really do, do with some video reports from New Zealand because it's hard to see, see what's going on, really. We do know there's some cases. We do know there's some community spread. Um, I'm anticipating that if you live in New Zealand, you are going to be infected fairly soon. Same as Western Australia, of course, these places that are being closed off. Omicron will get through and will spread rapidly throughout these populations. And the response of the government in New Zealand, um, I, I can't follow it all in detail, but I know that a lot of people in New Zealand are concerned. So this is from a concerned uh, emailer in New Zealand. Now, I, I do know who this person is, but I haven't got permission to release their name yet. They may allow their name to be released, but I won't release it yet because I haven't got express permission to do so. Uh, there were many at the borders in the quarantine system. So, so lots of people were being caught, but being quarantined. Uh, but now it's entered society. Very, very hard to qu quarantine uh, Omicron if you're getting any people coming in out of the country at all. So there is some community spread now in New Zealand, albeit limited. I think at the moment, from memory, it's about it's about 12 cases. It's about 12 to 15 cases uh, per million. So it's only a few, but that's a few tens of cases in the country. And that means Omicron has essentially got a foothold if they're community cases, as they are. So um, inevitably going to spread throughout New Zealand. Now, the thing about New Zealand is it's got very limited natural immunity so they are depending on vaccine induced immunity now that puts them in the same situation as australia and we have seen that that works to a large extent so i am fairly optimistic about it and of course the omicron will give that extra boost of immunity that people get from natural infection so all of new zealand's in red it's not a lockdown over 90 percent uh, vaccinated almost entirely uh, Pfizer's with booster now offered to uh, children plus five okay uh, you protect your grandma by getting vaccinated is what they're saying in New Zealand uh, do you because the data we've just read just looked at the distribution of CT values for both the E and the N genes uh, was similar in unvaccinated and vaccinated children aged 17 years and below in rounds 15, 16 and 17 of the REACT study. Uh, in other words, the viral loads, looking, look, looking at the viral load of the E and the N genes, the two internal genes, the, the, these are the ones that are not affected by vaccination in England. The, uh, the viral loads were similar in unvaccinated and vaccinated children who became infected. So if children become infected, whether they're vaccinated or not, will not protect grandma. So I don't like this sort of emotional presentation unless it's scientifically accurate. And we see that if children are infected, this is not scientifically accurate, as demonstrated by this uh, study. So uh, I, I report on what's being done in New Zealand. Uh, my comment, this is not my comment, this is the comment of my writer. <laughs> uh, in order to have such high rates of vaccination, both government sources and media really created a, a false fear to do so. Sorry to hear that. If you're in New Zealand and this is not your impression, do, do let me know. Um, or, or, or almost bullied those who are not vaccinated with a informal narrative that the unvaccinated could spread while the vaccinated do not. So th 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 this old idea that you get vaccinated to protect those around you in the age of Omicron is less accurate 
to put it mildly, than it was in Delta. The reason to get vaccinated in New Zealand is to protect yourself from hospitalisation. So let, let's just, I would pretty much prefer to be honest about that. People in New Zealand are no more stupid than the people in England. We respond to truth and reason, not to, uh, not, not, not to in information which could be construed as being one-sided. Uh, we were told that the government has a contract for Novavax as well as Pfizer. Now, this is a bit spooky. What's happened to Novavax protein-based vaccines? Why are we relying entirely on the genetic mRNA vaccines in New Zealand? Um, why aren't they using adenovirus vector vaccines in New Zealand? Um, why are they relying entirely on Pfizer? Uh, the horrendous models of hospitalizations and death presented on the news were uh, less than accurate, according to this to this to this uh, writer. So um, let, 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 let's hope he's got the wrong impression there, and that the government of New Zealand is. Uh, taking people along with them by explaining what is actually true and just to illustrate uh, this we, we did look at this a few days ago but th this is the um this is the hospitalizations in um california and this this has got massive relevance to new zealand massive relevance to new zealand uh, because there's not a lot of natural infection now what this shows is that so the higher up this graph you are the greater the risk so this, this is the worst here. So this line here with people at very high risk for hospitalization are in, in people that are unvaccinated with no previous exposure uh, to COVID-19. So to get the risk down, people in New Zealand who've got no previous COVID-19 diagnosis, they haven't been exposed, they need to be vaccinated. And if you're vaccinated in New Zealand, that will take your risk of hospitalization down from this line down to this line here you will massively reduce your risk. Now, you won't reduce your risk as much as people that are unvaccinated and have been exposed to the natural infection. But given that that's not an option in New Zealand at the moment, until Omicron comes, the risk from New Zealand is via, uh, the, the reduction in risk in New Zealand is via vaccination. So it's going to take it down from that level of risk sort of 16, 18 times more likely to get hospitalised down to that level of risk there, which is vaccinated with no previous exposure to natural infection. As we've said, natural exposure is better, but that's not an option in New Zealand. And that black line there, which is slightly uh, lower, uh, vaccinated uh, previous COVID-19 diagnosis. So people that have been, uh, actually, we, we can't really separate those lines. That would be, they're basically the same, those lines. And in terms of risk of uh, getting the infection, again, we see the same thing. Uh, th th this is rates of uh, laboratory confirmed COVID-19 cases in New York. And again, we see the unvaccinated are getting many more, uh, many more cases. And uh, if you are uh, vaccinated with no previous exposure, that would bring your risk down to that level. So we are we are seeing the the necessity of uh, vaccinating adults, at least in uh, New Zealand, to reduce that risk. Because while Omicron is less pathogenic, it can still make people sick if they are totally unprotected. And someone is totally unprotected if they've not been vaccinated and not had natural exposure. But I'm looking forward to this sort of benefit, uh, as we see here from people that have had natural infection, very low risks um, of infection, very low risk of hospitalisation once they've been exposed to Omicron. And we, we know from Professor Clancy that we can't go on vaccinating because um, there's a law of diminishing returns with vaccine. So um, if you've had two doses of vaccine, you're protected from symptomatic disease substantially for about uh, 20 weeks. If, you, if you've had a, a third dose, you're protected for about uh, 10 weeks. If you've had a fourth dose, that will go down further. It is not immunologically possible to keep vaccinating people and still have a good uh, immunological response. We have to move on, in my view, to natural infection, but we have to do that while we are still covered by these dramatically effective uh, vaccines demonstrated they're protecting against cases 
and demonstrated there protecting against hospitalizations. So you don't want your risk to be up here, you want your risk to be down there and that is achievable uh, with uh, vaccination even if you have not been naturally exposed. Okay, there we go. Um, so many things we could have picked to, to look at today, but um, but but that's just what we chose to look at. Oh, now I've, I've been leaving these books here for ages. Um, you can you can um, th th these are my books. The books are these are the books what I writ. Um, so um, you can download these completely free. Um, so th th this one's on disease processes. Uh, I put lots of diagrams in um, as well. Um, and this one's on um, normal body function. So a any interested person could uh, could read this one on normal body function, I would think, and make a bit of sense of it. Uh, just see how your body works a little bit more. And as we say, th those PDFs have made them completely free to download because that means people in all parts of the world can download them. And there has there has been lots of downloads, particularly in poor parts of the country, well, uh, in poor parts of the world, well over 100,000. So that is good. So... Uh, Download the PDFs, put it on your phone. There is a mobile phone friendly version as well as a PC friendly version and um, no need to be bored. Okay, thank you for watching.